All right, everyone, uh, welcome to our uh, professional development today. It's on uh, functional behavioral assessments, FBAs. And this is used in uh, special education, but also general education classrooms. And it's used to, it's used mostly for students with uh, behavior problems, behavioral disabilities, let's say. All right, so uh, the functional behavioral assessment, this is a workshop we're doing right here. And uh, first off, this is an older video I have here. It's kind of a short video. To about three minutes I think and it goes over all the steps and things like that very concise video so I'll put a link to that above uh, four, four minutes actually all right so let's open up with an overview here all right so at any school you're likely to find a handful of students that continually have difficulties following classroom rules that's a fact I don't care what to you know I always hear teachers say you know oh in 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 the you know in the higher you know, in the higher town schools, uh, the, those students always behave. No, behavior problems happen everywhere. All, all teachers have to deal with behavior problems. And a continued punishment and reprimand of students with inappropriate behavior isn't a recipe for, uh, for success. You know, some students you can punish them and punish them and punish them, and you're not going to get anywhere. So uh, schools must utilize research-based methods such as the Functional Behavioral Assessment, and it's, and it's abbreviated, we'll call it the FBA. That's what everybody calls it. So each FBA plan is individualized for a specific student and used as a problem-solving process of addressing inappropriate student behavior. Okay, so it's individualized and problem-solving process. Now uh, FBAs with their data are usually incorporated into an IEP, which is an individualized education program. So uh, IEP planning usually involves FBAs. If it's if it's called for, it'll be in the IEP. Now, FBAs first appeared under IDEA law in 1997, where they were mentioned as a viable strategy for working with emotionally disturbed students. Okay, emotional disturbed students uh, correlate with students with behavior problems. So, uh, what's the purpose, huh? The purpose is to identify a. Is uh, the goal is to identify the purpose of the behavior. How how does the behavior serve the students, right? So why. Why is a student behaving? FBA is the why. Why are students misbehaving? Now, functional behavioral assessments are ultimately used to determine the underlying reasons and causes, reasons and causes for damaging student behavior. Data from the FBAs are then used to create behavior intervention plans and other types of intervention strategies for students with behavior problems. FBAs are used in a positive way, right? You want to create a positive change and they're parts of positive behavior supports. Now, FBAs must identify specific problem behaviors. Those are the target behaviors, okay? Uh, target behaviors are behaviors that are the most disruptive uh, to the student and the classroom, okay? That's the behavior you want to focus on. So when you do an FBA, you want to identify, you know, you, well, first you want to choose the target behavior, and then you're going to do an FBA on that target behavior. Uh, I'll, I'll get into a little bit more. So uh, choosing the target behavior should be collaborative, right? So so what target behavior do you want to choose? And then you want to use the FBA to understand why a student is behaving in a certain way. And collaborative, because think about it, you know, this target behavior might affect a student who's in a number of different classes with the gym teacher, the art teacher, you know, the parent. It, it affects everybody, right? So besides figuring out the underlying cause of the behavior, FBAs look to identify supporting situations and the overall environment that leads to an appropriate behavior because maybe a student's acting a certain way because of a classroom environment or this his friends that he's around you got to really investigate so some of the problems that functional uh, behavioral assessments may address include non-compliance in the classroom uh, so uh, so this is what you might want to do an fba for right off task behavior throwing a tantrum maybe a student continuously throws tantrums uh, disruption of learning is a key one because that affects everybody in the classroom. So if a student is very disruptive, uh, that's when you might want to choose inappropriate social interactions and even threats and violence. Uh, you could want to use an FBA. So some a little bit of background. Uh, functional behavioral assessments have its origin in applied behavior analysis. Okay, and they're extensive. Uh, and FBAs are an essential component of positive behavior supports. Okay, so. Uh, Applied Behavior Analysis, ABA, is a more scientific approach to analyze and modify behavior, right? Uh, FBAs aren't just, you know, the teacher saying I should do this or I should do that. It's very research-based. Uh, 
Uh, it, requ it requires uh, driven by direct observation, experimentation, controls. Uh, and that's uh, ABA. Now FPAs are used as a are used as a baseline by ABA therapists to determine if interventions are causing actual change. Okay, so the, uh, you know they're gonna go back and and you know when we talk about FPAs, a lot of times it's it's an ABA therapist that's actually conducting these functional behavioral assessments. Uh, some schools use teachers, but it's recommended that that uh, somebody with knowledge in applied behavior analysis actually you know conduct the FBA. So this is a very detailed video on applied behavior analysis. If you want to learn something, I'm going to pause this right here. And we're going to skip it. I'll provide a link though. Um, okay. So FBAs make use of scientific approaches. So there's hypothesizing. And hypothesizing isn't just guessing, it's guessing based on data, on direct observations. So most often it's an ABA therapist or school behaviorist responsible for creating, implementing, and evaluating the FBA. These ABA therapists and behaviorists then work with school personnel to see positive changes in students. There's really no set rules or regulations as to when to con as to when to conduct an FBA, but it's better not to wait, right? So there's no time of when, but if, if, if the student is just constantly be, being a behavior problem, that's when you do it. Just don't wait. Usually FBAs are given when student behavior problem becomes a concern of a number of different individuals. If it's, you know, if student, if a student's behavior problem is upsetting the staff, the teachers, the administrators, classmates, parents, then, you know, you better get to it. Uh, the behavior problems leading to the FBA should be serious in nature, okay? They, you know, if it's something, something little, you don't want to conduct an FBA on that because they, they, you know, these FBAs, these things take time. These things take time. So uh, there are times where children are just being playful. You know, that's not when you want to do an FBA. Conducting FBAs, uh, you want to make sure it's it's really warranted. Now, the FBA process is used as a way to determine if special education services are needed although not always the case. Parents should consent, parent consent should be granted before implementation. So before you conduct this FBA, you wanna get consent from the parents. Parent consent is required if it is used as an initial evaluation or reevaluation. So then it's actually required. Now here are six step process to an FBA. Now, just because this is a six-step process, I've seen eight-step process, I've seen 12-step, I've seen four-step. You can go on the internet, you can see this, this is just the one, you know, this, this is the one I'm going with here. So first, you want to create a support team. Very important. It includes teachers, paraprofessionals, parents, behaviorists, case managers. All right. Before a given student is to receive an FBA, this support team must be created and the support team is going to ensure successful implementation. Members of the support team help provide the data. They do planning, implementation of strategies. And, you know, it might seem weird to do a support team for just one student. But it's necessary because, remember, these problems are serious and they continue to occur. In most cases, the FBA support team is simply the IEP team. Uh, but additional members may be included. Um school psychologists or behaviorists usually lead these support teams because they're the ones, the school psychologists, behaviorists, they're the ones that create the FBA. And so they'll choose team members and, you know, if, and listen, a lot of, you know, when, when we talk about this FBA support team, it's not like they're meeting once a week or something like that. It's like, it's like in the beginning and then they'll meet at the end to evaluate uh, how it's going. But it's, it's obviously, it's not a weekly thing. Support teams may be only required to meet one or two times a week. Oh, excuse me, uh, not a week, uh, maybe uh, required to just meet one or two times, that's it. Uh, if, if you want to meet more, that's fine. All individuals must be on the same page with a shared vision. And the vision is reducing the behavior problem. Okay, everybody's got to work together. The team, again, is responsible for collecting data. The BIP, which is very important, uh, that's the behavior intervention plan. So after you utilize this FBA, and the FBA is utilized to find out why a student is misbehaving, then you can create the behavior intervention plan. So you find out why they're behaving and you create a plan to target uh, that behavior, to reduce that behavior. So possible members of the team, teachers, psychologists, paraprofessionals, guardians, behaviorists, guidance counselors, you name it. Okay, so you create the support team and then you want to define the behavior. What's the, you, and, and when you define a behavior, it has to be in measurable and observable terms, okay? Everything, again, this is very data-driven. So 
evaluate their behavior in terms of frequency, duration, intensity. So the first step here is to identify an inappropriate behavior. Uh, the desired behavior, behavioral change should be agreed upon by all members of the team, right? So we want to define the behavior. If there is more than one consistent uh, behavior problem, uh, or if the team can't agree on a chosen, then multiple behaviors you can do, uh, can be studied at one time. So if the student's doing multiple uh, behavior, one is, uh, one is disruptive of uh, one is disrupting learning and the other one is just uh, you know breaking out in tears and crying that's a different one so you can do more if you have to uh, here are some exam some examples of possible target behaviors hitting others non-compliance talking back throwing objects cursing refusal to transition this is very targeted okay very specific the target behavior must be defined using observable and measurable terms. Avoid vague, vague language. It's best to be specific as possible. For example, uh, describing the behavior as acting out would not be as specific as saying yells, as the, uh, yells at the teacher. Okay, Acting out could be a lot of different things. If the student's yelling at the teacher, you want it to be like, you, yeah, you want to say yells at the teacher or screams at the, you know, very specific. So uh, here's just an overview of different types of behavior. You can have internalizing behaviors as our actions. And internalizing behavior is, is one where the student directs it towards himself. And maybe uh, something, uh, for example, depression, uh, you know, maybe taking uh, you know, drugs or pills or something like that. And externalizing behavior, on the other hand, is outward, physical violence towards somebody else. Okay, so you want to differentiate between the two. Now, when, I di when identifying the target behavior, FEAs must be specific, must specify the data instruments. What are you using to identify the behavior? Many times, it's checklists and inventories, and your, you know, behavior should have these on hand, and they'll use these uh, to conduct the FBA. The description of the target behavior again: frequency, measurement, and severity and intensity. Okay, frequency. How how often does the, does it occur? You know, in intensity. For example. Um, I don't know if I have a chart. Here's a good one. So let me just go over this. So uh, frequency, rate, duration, and don't worry about response latency. So um, if you want to know the frequency, for example, uh, that's how many times maybe, let's say the behavior of choice here is how many times is hitting another person. So Joe hits five times. The rate is uh, 12 hits in six hours. The duration, crying lasted for you know 10 minutes. And then if you would have intensity, it might be how hard would, would the hit be, okay? All right, so now we go to the next uh, step, which is to, uh, which is to uh, collect data. All right, so gather data to determine the cause and function. Data collection, support teams contribute the data. Remember that too, right? So all these teachers in Paris and everybody there, they're collecting the data. So, you know, they're going to analyze it, but they also collect it as well. And uh, some support team members may directly produce the data, such as paraprofessionals. You might have them mark the number of times that they saw a student throw an object. Other members of the team may look at a previous school records, may look at the previous students, uh, may look at the students' previous records. Some of the best data will come from students and parents. Okay, remember the parent is always the the best source to information on the child. Now the data collection must include both where and when the behavior happens. Again, you always want to be detailed. Uh, it must include conditions, individuals present, location, time of day. All of this is important because, again, the FBA determines the root cause. What's the root cause of the behavior? FBA think why. Now, uh, ABC charts or antecedent behavior consequent charts are used to gather meaningful, observable data on the target behavior uh, in the student's environment. The observer to the ABC chart records the actions leading up to the moment of behavior, which is the antecedent, right? So let's say you're studying a, a behavior, and it's, uh, you know, the, the student, let me see, uh, I think I have a good example here. Uh, here's a good example. So ABCs understand the role of consequences in the behavior. So what happens right before the target behavior? Uh, let's say the, the student um, threatens the teacher. So what is happening before the student threatens the teacher here? Well, the teacher's doing an assignment that the student doesn't know. Then the student, the behavior occurs. The student threatens the teacher, and what's the result? Well, the student gets to to uh, what's the result? The student gets to to leave the classroom and, and sort of enjoy some some time away, and then you can see, okay, well maybe the punishment is actually the reward, and that's why 
you know, the student's doing that. Or maybe the, the work is too hard and the student is just acting, you know, doesn't know the work. So it's a real investigation here. All right, so the observer to the ABC chart records the actions leading up to the moment of the behavior. That's the antecedent. So what's going to happen right before the student, you know, uh, curses out the teacher. And then the ABC chart records the consequence, what happens immediately after the behavior. Uh, very important, data from ABC charts is correlational, not causational, okay? And ABC chart data is used to create a hypothesis, okay? Uh, we mentioned earlier the importance of a hypothesis because, again, you want to, again, we said the purpose of an FBA is to determine the why, but the why is essentially that's our reason. That's our hypothesis of why a student's acting out this way based on our data and behavior. You know, we're never 100% sure, so that's why we call it a hypothesis. Okay. Uh, this is in the, this is this video. I actually do recommend watching. It's very. I think it's two minutes here, and it just goes over real quick on an ABC ABC charts and stuff like that. Okay, let me keep going. All right. So uh, again, we're on data collection. A common method is, is to do the group interview technique, a single interview with uh, multiple candidates. Uh, you know, the school. Uh, excuse me. The the whoever's uh, in charge of the support team can interview everybody, you know, in contact with the student to get some information. A lot of that would be, you know, other members on the support team. So the group interviewed must be in direct contact with the student. So if you're using a group interview technique, you just want to interview people that know a lot about the, the student and why he's acting out. If a high school, if it was a high school student interviewing all the students, teachers would be a good idea, right? So again, you would interview the art teacher, the music teacher, the gym teacher, his math teacher, everybody. Uh, the support team must take a deep look at all the data, such as frequency, intensity, duration, ABC charts, questionnaires, checklists. They got to look at everything. That's why this guy's got this magnifying glass. Review of the data occurs through the lens of identifying the function. Whenever you're looking at this data, you want to go, what's the function, right? FBA is the function of the behavior, right? Is the function of the student's misbehavior or inappropriate behavior, is it to avoid something or get something to desire, right? So we talk about this one. So in this case, the student's yelling at the teacher. Is it to avoid what's happening here, which is to avoid schoolwork, or is it to gain and get, uh, you know, out of the classroom and, and time on the computer or something? All right, so data analysis. Uh, FBA data analysis should study the following topics. Uh, student strengths and weaknesses, fast triggers, which are sudden environmental factors taking place right before the problem occurs, and slow triggers, which is a long-term environmental conditions, such as maybe the student's continually failing at school, and that is something that sticks with him, and every once in a while he, he acts inappropriately before that. Or is a fast trigger, maybe, you know, the student, uh, you know, somebody in the classroom is making a comment about the student's personal identity or something like that, and, and that's why they really act out. So again, it's, again, detective work, right? Individuals that are frequently present uh, during th the behaviors, right? Uh, that's what we should study. Who's there when these behaviors are happening? All right, so formulate a hypothesis, right? First, analyze the antecedents, fast and slow triggers, and then you're going to create a hypothesis. And the, hypothesis the hypothesis is the statement on what the underlying behavior causes are. What's the causes of these behaviors, right? This hypothesis, hypothesis statement must be created as a summary of why the team, the team believes the behavior is occurring. What's the purpose it serves the student? Uh, many of the behaviors take place so the student can simply get attention or avoid, or avoid work. I, I, from my experience, it's mostly to get attention. That's a big one. So just want attention. But there could be much more complex motivations. Uh, some of the more common reasons that a student misbehave. These are common reasons for misbehavior. Needing attention, escaping boredom, avoiding interactions, to acquire resources, to remove discomfort, for just for internal stimulation. So the hypothesis statement is the educated guess based on data. And the hypothesis is the foundation of the plan, of the behavior intervention plan that's going to follow the FBA. When writing a hypothesis statement, include the challenging behavior, the antecedent, and the consequences. Here's a sample hypothesis statement from an, from an FBA. When Joseph is asked to be on task and complete his work, he begins to throw objects across the room and shouts out to other students in order to escape the classwork and earn 
added attention. So there's two reasons for, for that. And this is an excellent hypothesis statement. All right, now you got to create the behavior intervention plan, right? So you can I, you can understand why a student is misbehaving, but uh, you know now you've got to attack that. You've got to attack it, and you want to reduce that problem, and you need a plan. So let's do it. the The BIP serves the following purposes: uh, to describe how the environment must change to prevent problems, because a lot of times there's triggers in the environment. You also want to provide alternative pathways to, in to instruction that will allow the student to be more successful in class and reduce inappropriate uh, behavior. And list the type of reinforcements and consequences for positive and negative student behavior. Now, a creation of the, of the plan is usually the sole responsibility of the behaviorist or psychologist. The behaviorist does gather input from the team, okay, again, and data should be shared, but usually it's the behaviorist. A BIP should have an antecedent strategy to prevent negative behaviors. For example, moving a child's desk. Okay, so if like a student's constantly, uh, you know, uh, misbehaving because the person next to him is insulting him, and then they act out, and they, then you gotta, you know, beforehand you want to attack it before it happens, right? So you want to move the desk. Uh, it must also include response, right? So we said antecedents is what happens before. A response is, you know. What happens later, the plan must include response strategies for when the students behave in positive ways and negative ways. So, uh, let's see here. I, I think we got a, a, a good example of a... Oh, here's the video here. And this kind of goes over the steps to a behavior plan and, and things like that. This one you should watch too, but let me go back first. So, we're on the behavior intervention plan. So, overall, the plan must include, at a minimum... A description of the behavior, of the target behavior, this is the BIP, the hypothesis, the root cause, uh, positive behavior supports, additional services to be rendered, and specific behavioral interventions and instructional strategies. Okay, this is a good video. Gives you, gives, I'll, I'll put a link in the description. Hold on. And now you got to implement it, right? So you create the plan, you got to put it into action. So when implementing the plan, all individuals working closely with the students should try their best uh, not to place added attention on the students. You know, if uh, we have a BIP plan, don't make it obvious. I've seen students really lose their cool over this. And, um, you know, I, I don't blame them for being upset when everybody's kind of looking at them and all that stuff. You don't want to never want to embarrass a, a student. Students are being, you know, when students are being observed in classroom settings, they may feel anxious, and which can lead to more problems. You know, you never want to be the one to cause the problem. And monitor the implementation, right? You got to implement it, and then you got to see what's going on. Is the behavior increasing or decreasing? Is it working? Everything begins and ends with assessment, right? The BIP must have a baseline measure, frequency, duration, intensity of a target behavior, because you want to know if it's working. The baseline must include data across multiple settings, and the baseline is used to determine the intervention plan to determine if it's a success, right? So you need the baseline to know if you're improving. Is the behavior decreasing? That's what you need to do, frequency, duration, intensity, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Uh, progress monitoring is needed to ensure all individuals are doing their part as well as to quantify the rates of improvement towards the goal. All right. Is it working again? Uh, progress monitoring it looks at frequency, intensity, duration of target behavior. We kind of went over this. Uh, student IEPs should reflect dates of evaluation and progress monitoring of BIPs. So if you are creating a plan, it should be in the IEP, and you should you should uh, list the dates. Now, again, right, everything begins and ends in assessment. I've been saying that. So the support team, the IEP team, must determine whether this plan is working. You got to go back, right? Uh, you know, you create the FBA, you find a target behavior, you understand why it's acting, you create a hypothesis, you put this plan in place, and has it worked? Obviously, the plan won't always be successful. That doesn't mean the team has to start from scratch. I think you just make adjustments from the plan along the way. Uh, the most important thing here, working with behavior problems, students with behavior problems, the most important thing is to never give up on, on them. Many teachers give up on students with behavior problems, and it's, uh, it's the worst thing you can do. Never quit on them. Okay, here's just a nice overview uh, of kind of everything we did, a little background. We said the purpose, support team. You can take a look at this. You can pause this. And, uh, you know, I just want to say thank you. Uh, this this uh, is an important topic, and I'll see you in the next.